One of the most effective ways, and it's going to seem counterintuitive, is for you to reflect about the things that are the worst in your life at the moment. Research has shown it's easier to identify because people can immediately rattle off, I don't like my job, I don't yeah. like this, etc. And the second bit of research shows that people are more likely to act on those goals than they are hypothetical goals. I'd love to have a $10 million boat. Fantastic, but I might forget about it in 10 seconds. Mm. But the thing in my life bothers me, I'm not going to forget about it in 10 no. seconds. No. So that's where I would advise them to start. First time goal setters, where are the issues and what are we going to do about it? Well, I'm very excited, Matt, to be here with you on our next episode of Be The Drop. Thank you so much for joining me. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Uh, I'm very, very excited. And I know you've got your item of significance here. Can you explain that and a bit of a story behind it? Yes, yes. So I, uh, I brought a copy of my last book and it is, uh, out of all the things that I've written or uh, created on a pr professional level, it's the one that I have had the most attachment to because it's the most personal. On a number of levels, one, there are personal stories in there on how I discovered certain subjects or topics uh, um, and I described the setting, etc. So when you write your own personal experiences, you create a connection to it. And, uh, and secondly, it's everything that I believe in as a human being about achievement, about success, about trying to make your life meaningful and significant, uh, creating um, a, a kind of existence that you're proud of and, and, and a life that you really enjoy. So a lot of attachment. Yeah. Very personal. Right. And so then how have you taken something that's very personal and shared that and built a community around that? I think everyone in general uh, tries to achieve something at some stage of their life. So it, many people think of success as money and for a lot of people that might be the case. Generally as human beings, most of us have that internal drive to do something. Mm. And, uh, and so when you take everything that you know on the subject, all the research that you've done for more than 20 years and put it into a book, uh, a lot of people become interested in knowing what's in it, how can I apply it. So that was the, you know, the personal item, but it also then creates a community. Readers, they talk about it, they create groups, etc. And it's a beautiful feeling to think that the experiences you've had and the research you've done positively impact other people. Mm. It's very satisfying. Yeah. And um, you mentioned it as well, but something I really loved when reading the book was your integration of story in amongst I mean, and you've got a lot of, there's a lot of research that's referenced there. Yes. I was like, wow, you're very well read. Like to write that sort of book, I think it's it's a really lovely balance Thank you. of quite, you know, and a text that's got a lot of references, scientific yes, yeah. references, yep. but also personal story. How did you go about bringing that together? It's a, gr it's a great point and uh, my family is very science oriented. So uh, my, my parents have PhDs, master's degree in mathematics, engineering mm. and so forth. So I come from a, a science evidence based upbringing. Yeah. So I was always taught prove it, reference it. Uh, my father's been a professor at the university for you know 40 years, mm -hmm. wrote hundreds of research publications where you reference every yeah. little claim oh, you that, make. That makes sense. Yeah, then. so I think, I think that rubbed off where I didn't want to just make wild claims. Matt believes X, Y, Z. Mm -hmm. I wanted to say this is a proven fact and if you don't believe me, here's a footnote of where you can do more research. Yeah. I think that's more compelling. And the second part of it is I uh, always loved writing. I thought uh, in many stages of my life I'd actually become a full-time writer. I, I appreciate great literature, the classics, the, the beauty that can be conveyed on black and white, you know, on mm. words on, on paper. So I think those two things collide in a book like that. You come from a science background, you want to footnote everything you say, but you love eloquence, you love uh, the beauty of uh, spoken and written words, mm. and you want to capture some of those and embed them into a book. Yeah. How do you go about selecting, you know, the bits that go in, what doesn't? Sure. You know, you've created... And probably to expand on that question, you've created doors that you yes, go through yep. within the book. You yep. know, is there, a, I mean, there's probably, this is such a, a big question, but yeah. how did you get to that point where you've identified those? It's, it, it's a really good question and, and there's quite a simple answer. First of all, uh, 
I wanted to learn about success, for lack of a better description, when I was 18 and became an entrepreneur. So I began talking to people, reading books, attending events on this general subject of success, both say in sales and marketing, in business, in from motivational speakers, goal setting, just wide variety of, uh, of data points. And with time, uh, I continued to read and so forth, I began to connect the dots. Well, that whole event really talked about this one concept, which we can describe it as, as goal setting and planning, for, for example. And then I would read university studies and they would begin fitting under this one singular category. So from all of the data, the, they begin to just cluster into categories. You would read things from behavioral finance and how decisions are made and decisions are guided by what people value and what they believe. And that begins to fit over here about the importance of belief and, and so on. So I think if you read enough, if you listen to enough, you can begin categorizing what you take in into blocks. And after all of those years, they just neatly fit into these five areas. And almost anything I've read since fits into one of those five. Yeah. And it's it just so it emerged from all the data. I, I love how simplistic you make it sound. I do. <laughs> all you gotta do is read 5,000 books and I mean, anyone can do it. <laughs> yeah, but then also just the ability to categorize is actually quite a good skill. And you talk about clarity. Yes. Um, which I loved, you know, and I've written it on my whiteboard. And do you think that really comes back to that, the goal setting clarity, at the, the, you know, from, you know, coming through at the very beginning? Yeah, I, I'm a huge believer. And this is another reason why the book is so personal. Everything in there I fundamentally believe, hand on heart, yeah. it's the truth. And I follow it and I apply it and it's emerged from everything that I've read, researched and the people that I've spoken to. So if your goal becomes to write a book like that, mm. which it did for me, uh, then I began thinking about how would I write it? And that created a tremendous amount of clarity on how it should be structured and how it should be categorized because it's not so much the writing of it, it's so it's uh, easily assimilated by the reader. That's, I, I could write it and I th could think it's fantastic, but if I give it to you and you read it and can't make heads or tails out of it, it's, yeah. it's failed. So if the goal becomes I want to write a book where I can um, condense more than 20 years of research into something that's easy and simple to read and conveys the points in a very logical manner and the reader can pull those out and apply them. If that becomes the goal, then you begin actively thinking mm -hmm. about how does it need to be categorized and what are the major themes and what should be the order that you begin putting them in. There's lots of things that I would like to do that I haven't done yet. Like I would actually love to get into script writing and uh, producing movies. Oh, it's, it's, uh, it's a thing that I definitely will do uh, before I die, which hopefully is you know, not gonna be soon. But then there's a lot of other things that I wanna do as well. My kids are growing up and I wanna be there at home for them. Uh, I wanna create another company. I wanna write a few more books. So I have that, I wanna travel and show my kids and, and, uh, and my wife all of these you know, exotic places, etc. So then you've gotta kind of prioritize. So it's not about uh, letting go of shiny things or saying I've got to focus on this. You can keep all of your shiny things. What is the order in which you want to do them or the best order in which it makes sense to do them? And that's the way I kind of think about it rather than this is the only thing that I'm going to do and I need to do away with my other longings, desires, yeah. and, and, and goals. Yeah. It's, like, it's like the chapters in the book. There's a logical way they should be presented, and perhaps the things that you want to do, there's a logical way of achieving them as well, or doing them. So we're, we're moving into the new year. Yep. So it, it is a good time for, for you know that reflection. Yeah, this kind of thinking. Yeah, it's interesting because obviously I know your approach is this needs to be ongoing and all the time, but yeah. I do feel that the beginning of a year, I think that new calendar year is a great time to sort of kick off and get going. Yes. So, I mean, what are your thoughts on that? Oh, I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, not only is it kind of the end of a cycle, you know, the, the earth travels around the sun, a whole year is completed. Uh, it's the end of uh, another calendar year, end of maybe not a business year because we run different financial years in, in Australia. But whenever you have the feeling of uh, uh, phases completed, uh, for human beings, it has this uh, uh, rejuvenating, renewal kind of element to when a new phase is about to begin. And with yeah. that feeling, it's the ideal time to, sh to take a step back from the day-to-day -day and, and uh, create some strategic thought 
around your business, around your life, around the things that are important to you, and say, how do I want these things to be yeah. in the coming year? And, uh, and, and so I think it's also an ideal time because a lot of people have holidays. And when you have holidays, you, your mind relaxes, you, uh, you de-stress, and it puts you in a better thinking uh, environment to mm. do those kind of things. So I think it's the perfect time. Throughout the year, it's just typically execution. It's hectic, it's busy, there's a million things going on, time seems to fly. Mm. And, uh, and, and this, air, this uh, time when we come to the end of the year, a new one's about to begin, we have some time off, the weather's nice, and so perfect. Yeah. Couldn't be better. Yeah, good. So, you know, if somebody's doing that and they're at the beginning, mm -hmm. you know, and they're, and they're at that beginning of, of a goal setting process, yep. what sort of advice would you give to get started? Where like, you know, sometimes it can be overwhelming. One of the most effective ways, and it's going to seem counterintuitive, is for you to reflect about the things that are the worst in your life at the moment. Research has shown it's easier to identify because people can immediately rattle off, I don't like my job, I don't yeah. like this, etc. And the second bit of research shows that people are more likely to act on those goals than they are hypothetical goals. I'd love to have a $10 million boat. Fantastic, but I might forget about it in 10 seconds. Mm. But the thing in my life bothers me, I'm not going to forget about it in 10 no. seconds. No. So that's where I would advise them to start. First time goal setters, where are the issues and what are we going to do about it? One of the things that I really loved in the book was the goal setting pyramid. Yes. And I know that you can download a copy of that yep. off your website as yep. well. Is that something you use quite frequently? All the time. I've got one in my briefcase uh, in the car. Uh, and, I, and I use it for a very simple reason, it works. So I, I'm a very practical person. Uh, it's never, abstract theories have never appealed to me. Uh, mm. I, I'm interested in the practicality of things. So I, I couldn't write a book about abstract theory and hypotheticals. That might be very interesting and it might create a philosophical discussion over you know, wine and cheese, etc. But when it comes to very concrete subjects like achievement and so forth. Mm -hmm. I want things that are practical. And the goal pyramid, uh, and it's available on the on the book's website, uh, lifeinhalfasecond.com, uh, there's free videos, all of the resources are free, is a downloadable one-page document with an attached video of how to apply it where you can distill what you're trying to achieve into one singular page that you can carry around in your pocket, look at, um, reflect, focus, it works. And mm. that's why I use it. And I would never write about something in a book and then do something different. Because yeah. then I'd write about the different thing that I'm doing because clearly that's better than what's in the book. Yeah. Now, when we were talking uh, as your approach to writing this book, you mentioned the importance of, of putting storytelling and making yeah. it personal and adding that side into the book. Yes. Is that something you do in business as well? Yes. Uh, I, and that's why I want to make a movie eventually because I love storytelling and I love the medium. I, I'm interested in people's stories. I think people connect with stories. They say that you know storytelling is older than you know civilizations and 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 so on. And uh, in business, you could go in and have a conversation that's very, let's say, mechanical. Uh, we do X, Y, Z, and the outcomes are A, B, D, and we've been in business X and Y, and it's very mechanical and dry. But if you tell a story that connects you to the problem, to your business, gosh, that resonates a hundred times better, and people are actually going to listen and remember that than you know abstract, dry facts, so to speak. So I love telling stories. I see over time people uh, react to stories and they remember them, and it reinforces that you should keep doing it so mm. and so for a business as well as part of their communications and driving sales do you think story plays a part without it yes without a doubt without a doubt if if uh, people could communicate their value proposition in stories in uh, in ways that people can just identify with it's memorable, there's a personal connection to it. I think businesses forget that they're actually communicating with people. They think they're selling to other businesses, et cetera. We're, we're all people doing business with other people. And the things that we enjoy, we forget sometimes that a lot of other people enjoy those things as well. Mm. And so at that business development level for B2B, um, is that more, much more an interpersonal relationship building requirement? Yes, uh, I think that the bigger your sale is, and the more uh, people are involved in it, the more the relationships become important. It's not like buying a book. You don't need a relationship with anyone to buy a book. And if you don't like it, you can throw it in the trash or donate it to the library. But you know, if you, if you buy a house for $2 million 
and you've chosen the wrong build and so forth, that's a much more kind of significant. So I think generally as the dollars increase, the importance of can I trust them? Are they gonna be around? Are they gonna do the right thing by me? Those become really important considerations. Mm -hmm. And so the face-to-face, -face, the personal connections become very important. Yeah. Yeah. People want to know who they're doing business with and they want to have comfort that you will be there if things don't go right mm. and you'll be there even if things do go right. So really then it's about, it, that's coming back to your audience but also the products and services Correct. that you're selling? Very much so. Yeah. yeah. What are you selling to what market? That market consumes information in what way? Mm. Uh, where, how can you be where they are? Yeah. And that, is that online? Is that at physical events? Is that in things they read? You need to be where they are. Mm. And it's different for depending on what you sell to what market. Mm, absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Matt. I've loved Pleasure. sharing these insights with you. But in conclusion, could you share with me your be the drop tip, which is your top communication tip? Uh, I think um, it's hard to kind of distill it into one, but uh, you've got to be sincere in your communication. You have to believe in what you're doing or talking about. Mm. And I think you have to be conscious of the fact that people's attention spans today are much shorter than they used to be. Mm. So if I could give a communication tip, you know, no one wants to hear any more about fluff and dry or company line statements, et cetera. It's just people, it just gets filtered out as noise. They wanna hear genuine communication about things that people believe in and care about. Mm. And they wanna hear it in a way that they can easily pick it up and consume it. They don't want to listen to it for an hour. Yeah. Just just tell me, just you know, get to the meat, tell it to me and so forth. Yeah. So I think communication today has to be like that. It has to be sincere, it has to be genuine. Uh, you have to, like you can tell that I really believe in the book. It's not just up somebody else's book and I'm here kind of promoting. I really believe in, it's a very uh, personal item. Uh, and so you have to have that in your communication and you have to do it in a very succinct manner because attention is just like that these mm. days. So if you're gonna communicate, I think you have to keep that in mind. Mm.